And after, well, before God gave the commandments to Moses. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testimony was in his hand. This is Exodus 32, verse 15. The tables were written on both their sides, and the one side and on the other were they written. Do you know what happened before then? What if I told you God was about to wipe out and annihilate everybody that he turned around and gave the commandments to? Just one verse before that. So let's start at verse number eight. It says, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made a molten calf. Remember, they made the golden calf and have worshipped it, which is the absolute worst thing you do. If you want to make God mad, worship an idol and have sacrificed thereunto. Or you can make something your idol and worship that without even knowing it. And said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Out of all of the things that God did for the children of Israel, they turned around and said, he didn't do it. This golden calf did it. That's another way to make God extremely angry. Verse number nine, and the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. That means move out of my way that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them. And I will make of thee, Moses, a great nation. God is going to change his mind about these people all to the point where he's going to have to alter his covenant that he made with Abraham. And he's going to bless Moses' seed instead because these people have worshipped an idol. They have gone too far. They have done what they shouldn't have done. Moses was asking God, hey, calm down. Don't do that. Don't kill the people. Because if you kill them, the Egyptians are going to say that you took them all the way from Egypt, took them into the wilderness to kill them. So he begged God not to do that. And God listened to him and he changed his mind. Right after he listened to him, changed his mind, the very next thing that God did was gave them commandments. I'm not going to kill you. Here are some commandments. Does that make any sense? Do y'all catch that? If God decided to destroy every one of his own people, okay, and the next thing he does is give them commandments, do you think that his mercy is dependent upon them keeping the commandments? What do you think? And Moses besought the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why do thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thy own self and saidest unto thee, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and thou shalt inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. God changed his mind about what he was going to do to his own people. Thank you for reading that for me. That was the first time I can find where God changed his mind. Another time, well, no, he changed his mind with Adam. He could have wanted to, probably should have destroyed Adam. But here's another time when God put um, the eight people on the ark. That was because he was going to destroy everybody. And he decided he's going to start the world over with these eight people. And he let them slide. Verse number uh, one in Jonah chapter one. We're going to go through Jonah real quick. This is a real quick chapter. But I want to point out something that most people don't point out. I want to point out some things that people don't normally talk about. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amadei, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And Jonah rose to flee to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord, went down to Joppa, verse number four, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, that, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid. So the shippers came to him and said unto him, what meanest thou, O sleeper? So the ship is about to crash. They don't understand what's going on. This is for those of you who don't know the story of Jonah. I'm going to go through it really quick. But uh, Jonah was asleep while the, the ship was about to be wrecked. It's rain, it's storm, the, the, it's thunder, it's lightning. And they can't understand why is this dude down in the basement sleeping? Jonah is sleeping because he knows who God is. He knows who he is to God. Verse number seven, and they said on everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know who's causing this, this evil to come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. So they realized where the problem is coming from. 
Verse number eight. Then said they unto him, tell us, pray thee, for which cause this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? Where did you come from? What is your country? And what people are thou? So think about this. The whole ship is about to get wrecked. Everybody's about to die. And the first thing they want to ask Jonah is, where do you work? What do you do? Where do you come from? And Jonah answered them saying, I am a Hebrew. Because that's all he needed to say. Him saying he's a Hebrew answered all of their questions. What is your occupation? Where did you come from? What is your country? All he have to say is he's a Hebrew. But he continues saying, and I fear the Lord. I'm going to tell you which Lord I fear. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land that you're worried about. Think about that for a minute. Everybody knew what it meant to say, I am a Hebrew. They had their own gods, but Jonah had his God. And all we need is Jonah's God to get you out of trouble. Verse number 10, then were the men, something else, exceedingly afraid and said unto him, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. Then they said unto him, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm? So here we now, this, these people have decided we got to do something because God's child is on this ship. We got to get rid of him. Jonah offered to be thrown overboard because he know what the problem was. He didn't want to go do what God told him to do. So he asked and offered them to throw him over the ship. And that's fine. It's fine because he knows that he doesn't want everybody to die simply because of him. Everybody knew who the God of the Hebrews are. They knew who he was when he said Hebrew. That is a, a biblical ethnicity. What is your biblical ethnicity? Uh, he said, I also fear the Lord. You can't just be an ethnic Hebrew. You can't just be a Hebrew. You can't just be an Israelite. You have to also fear the Lord. Fear the Lord means I'm going to keep his commandments. That means I've already been baptized in Jesus name. That means I've already been filled with the Holy Ghost. That means I'm not just a Hebrew that I'm trying to live holy. Let's skip down. I'm going to try to save some time. Verse number 12. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea so that the sea can be calm with you. Jonah knew that his, his sins is going to affect others. Did you know that your sins aren't your own? Did you know you could prevent a sinner from being saved? Can you put that here so this whole this? Did you know that you can cause heartache for your entire family by the sins that you commit? Did you know that you can your sins can infect people in your circle, your friends? Do you... Do you think that everything that you do is just okay and you're just going to get away with it? Do you think that the person that you want to be saved is saved because they are hanging around you uh, just because of God's mercy? Do you think that a person that wants to be saved could come near you, could come around you, could talk to you and be saved based on your actions, based on your anointing, based on your power? Verse number, I'm going to skip down. Verse number 13. Verse number 13 means, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land but they couldn't for the sea was wrought so they tried to get the boat to get to the to the land and they couldn't because the, the it was a, a storm like a hurricane they tried to get rid of what was causing the problem they tried to get rid of the container of sin at that point jonah was the problem jonah was the container of sin and if we take that and we look at it in our own lives what is the container of sin in our life what is causing us problems in our life? Why do we have these issues in our life? Whatever it is, you need to get it away. Get sin away from you. Get sinners out of your circle. I don't care if it's your family. I don't care if it's your friend. I don't care if it's your coworker. Get sinners away, away. Sanctify yourself and get away from sinners. Skip down to number verse number 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from raging. The moment they got rid of sin, there was peace. There was calm, wow. no more tempted sea raging. There's no more guilt. There's no more shame. Is the problems of your life, is it because of sin? Verse number 16, then the man feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto him. That's because getting rid of sin or stop sinning isn't enough. Stop smoking isn't enough. You know why? Because there are people who never smoke. So you stop smoking isn't equal to somebody who never smoked. So just not doing something isn't enough. You have to make a sacrifice to God. It has to be a sacrifice. So the, the person who stopped doing something, the person who stopped lying, the person who stopped cursing, that person is, is not the same as somebody who never did it. You have to make a sacrifice. And you have to make a vow. If you read verse number 16, it said, and made vows. 
So now it's time for you to make a vow to the Lord, even though you make a sacrifice. What are you saying? And Levi's, they always did uh, sacrifices of sin. Like whenever you sinned, you always had to bring to the Levi's. You had to bring a sacrifice yeah. to the Levitical priesthood for them to uh, make a sacrifice and kill that animal and spread his blood on the mercy seat of God for your sins to be remitted. That's exactly right. Verse number 17, it proves that there is no such thing as Good Friday. Y'all want to talk about that? Because the Bible says, J Jesus said, just like Jonah was in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights. Verse number 17 disproves Good Friday. You cannot get three days and three nights from Good Friday. If you don't believe me, go book a hotel starting on Friday and book it for three nights and tell me what day you get paid. You have to pay for it. All right, verse number, is this chapter number two? Verse number. Verse number one. Verse number one. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, arise, go into Nineveh, Nineveh. Oh, okay, so. Nineveh. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Is that chapter two? I think we skipped one, I'm sorry. We should be here. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. So he's in the belly and now he wants to pray. Why in the world do you wait until there's calamity to pray? Can somebody tell me if you pray for a situation in your life that's disturbing you, that's causing you problems, a sickness or whatever, why did you wait until there's a sickness? Why don't we pray beforehand? Also, when God delivers you, why don't you praise him with the same intensity that you prayed? You stayed up all night long praying, walking the floors. Your pillow is wet with tears because you want God to deliver you. But all of a sudden, God delivers you and you just thank you, Jesus, and go on about your business. What's up with that? You have to pray, man. You have to pray in the morning. You have to pray on the toilet. You have to pray when you eat. You have to pray when you're driving. You have to pray when you wake up in the middle of the night. Don't go into the refrigerator. Pray. God probably made you wake up so you can talk to him. He knows that something is coming down the road. He knows what's in store tomorrow. We need to pray without ceasing. Pray before you take your test in school. Pray before you get on the school bus. Pray before you walk out of the house. Just pray. Don't wait until there's problems to pray. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thy of thanksgiving. I will pray that I have vowed. Salvation Told you. Is of the Lord. Told you you have to sacrifice and you have to make a vow. That's two times. Why don't you do that right now? Why don't you make a sacrifice right now to give up something that you're doing that's carnal, something that you're doing that's in the way. I want you to think about something right now, right now that you that you could change. It doesn't have to be a sin because Paul said lay aside the sin and the weight. Think about something right now that you can sacrifice and give up for God and make him a vow. That means make God a promise. Do it. Make God a promise. Sacrifice something and make him a promise. What does verse number 10 say? And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. You notice it didn't happen until he made a vow, until he made a sacrifice. There's some things going on in your life, and you're probably not going to get rid of it until you make a vow, until you make a sacrifice. I'm trying to get you out of the trouble you're in. All right, let's see if we can go to chapter 3. I think that's, that's working. Chapter 3, verse number 2. I got it. It says, Arise and go into Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto the city that I bid thee. So notice God comes back with the same exact instructions. He's telling you to do the same thing that he told you to do before. It doesn't change. You don't get away with it. It doesn't, it's just because God probably whooped you or put a, uh, something on you. Doesn't mean it's going to go away. Doesn't mean you're going to get any new um, instructions. You still got to live holy. You still got to comply right. with the word. There's still a dress code. There's still a dietary law. You still have to obey the word of God. You still have to follow the commandments. Verse number nine. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? God is sovereign. You don't know what he's going to do. You don't know if you can uh, sin when you get older. I know a lot of young people think, oh, I'm just going to hang out. I'm going to do my thing. And when I get older, then I'll get saved. You don't know if God is going to allow you to come back. You don't know if God is going to forgive you. You don't know what God is going to do. Today, if you hear his voice, while the blood is running warm in your veins, that's the day that you begin to serve God. What does it say next? Turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Who can tell if God will re return and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? These people are looking for a sign. They can't figure out, well, how do we know if God is going to um, 
stop the ship from being destroyed. We don't know. We need somebody to help us. We need a man of God to pray for us. We need a man of God to intercede, to, uh, intercede for us. And sometimes that's what we need in our life. Sometimes we need that one person that can get a prayer through. Sometimes you need to adjust your circle. Sometimes you can't have a bunch of carnal people around you. Sometimes you can't have a lot of unspiritual people around you. Sometimes you need somebody in your circle. Sometimes you need somebody that can get a prayer through that's living holy and walking up right before you. So when you can't pray, they'll pray for you. When you don't feel like fasting because you just can't, they will do it for you. Verse number 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. They repented. They stopped what they were doing. They made a sacrifice. They made a vow. Even though Jonah was going to went there to preach to them and tell them God is going to kill every last one of you and God is going to destroy you. They stopped. They heard the word of God and they repented and changed their mind. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. So God changed his mind. I'm so glad that I serve a God that is, yeah, can change his mind. I'm yes. so glad that I serve a God who has yes. compassion and you can feel our pain and he knows what we're going through. I'm so God, glad that God has the ability to change his mind about me. Are you glad that he's able to change his mind about you? Yes. What if he would have executed judgment on you? What if he would have said, no, you messed up, you went too far? What if he would have said, no, you did, you did the worst thing this time? No, I'm not going to let you slide anymore. It's too late. I'm so glad that God didn't give me what I deserve. I'm so glad that God yes. has compassion for me. Thank you. Verse number one in Jonah chapter four, and this is the last chapter. We just read the whole book of Jonah. You guys can now say I read an entire book in the Bible. <laughs> Verse number one, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he's very angry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God, you're not going to kill these people? You're not going to wipe them out? After all that I went through, I was in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights suffering. You mean to tell me everything that I did, all of my sacrifices for the ministry was for nothing? Verse number three, I'm skipping down just to save some time. What is verse number Therefore three? Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. This is a man of God that is depressed and he's suicidal? You mean to tell me that God's people can be suicidal? You mean to tell me that God's people can be so upset that they don't care about their own life anymore? Are you telling me that even though you're saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and you're baptized in Jesus' name and you're doing everything that you're supposed to do, you mean to tell me that you have to suffer some of the same things that sinners have to suffer? Yes, because God is going to get the glory out of your life. Because even though you're going through what they go through, you can still praise him. You still have the opportunity to still lift him up. You still have the opportunity to give him glory and not give up. This is a man of God and he's talking about suicide. See, we're not honest sometimes. We try to make it seem like we're bigger and badder and, than we really are. And if we really be honest, we might be able to help somebody. Your testimony might be able to help somebody if you can tell somebody, yeah, I'm going through the same thing, but here's how I did it. I'm overcoming this by doing X, Y, Z. I'm praying more. I'm hiding my face in the Bible. If you are able to just be honest sometimes, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another, that you might be healed. All right, verse number four. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Why are you mad? So you're mad. This is how you know God is a human. <laughs> God is asking Jonas, hey, what you mad for? Is it a good thing to be angry? Is it a good thing to be angry? No. <laughs> is it? Is it a good thing to be angry? The Bible said be angry and sin not, but he never said whether being angry was good or bad. And he's asking now, is it a good thing to be angry? Are you still mad at the person that did something to you? Are you still mad at somebody who did something to you as a child? It's time to let it go. You still mad about what God allowed to happen to you? It's time to let it go. Are you still mad about the hurt? The pain that you had to suffer, it's time to let it go. I know you have no answers. It's time to let it go. I know you don't have an explanation. It's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. Verse number five. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat it under the shadow till he might see what become of the city. So now Jonah is waiting to see what's going to happen to folk. That he wants to see if God's going to destroy them. He wants to see if God's going to take them out. He's nosy, but he actually more than just wants to see it. He actually wants that to happen, right? This is this is what we do, right? When we we want to see God fix somebody, 
our enemies, the people who did us wrong. We want to see God go out, go after them and get them. We want we want karma to happen to people, but we don't believe in karma, right? right no, right. we don't believe in karma. <laughs> we believe in what's called the law of reciprocity. We believe in what we call you reap what you sow. Oh. That's what you get for what you did. Karma is from um, another religion. I don't remember what the religion religion is. Okay. But we don't believe in karma. We don't say that. We say you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to verse number six. And the Lord God prepared a grove. A gourd, yeah. And made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. While you're sulking, while you're being a Debbie Downer, God is covering you. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. A gourd is, if you can see there, that green thing, that's the best picture I can come up with. That's like a squash, like a... a Pumpkin, I guess, a squash, yeah, I guess. Yeah, okay, yeah. so God just made a tree of that okay. or he just made one big one, but it gave him the shade to cover him. If you read further on, it'll show you why he did that. Does it say in verse number six? Uh, so Jonah was exceedingly glad of the Lord. That's okay, so God is giving him provision. God is covering him and make, he's literally covering him and making sure that the heat from the sun doesn't kill him because right now he's in Nineveh, which is in modern day today, that's Iraq. You know, over in Iraq, it's really hot. It's a desert over there. So God creates something for you. Even though you whining, complaining, and want to kill yourself, God is not just going to leave you like that. So God is covering him. How is God covering him? He's sending him through this, but how is he covering him? He's covering him just by being there. He's yeah. covering him just by being concerned about his grief. This is the kind of God we serve. Everybody can't say that. Other religions can't say that. We have a God who's trying to help him with his grief. Even though he's not gonna take what's causing him the grief away, he's there to help you in your grief. It ain't what you want, but it's what God's response is. And you know God's response is never what we expected. We always wanna get out. We always want it to be over. We always want deliverance. We also want blood. We want justice. But God is gonna create a shadow to protect you from something worse. You worried about your, your issues now, but God is protecting you for something even worse and you don't see it. God does care about your grief. God does care about your heartache. God does care about your broken heart. Verse number seven. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smart the girl, the girl <laughs> that it withered. Wait, so first thing God created was what? A fish. I think I read somewhere it called it a whale. Yeah. God prepared a whale. Then God prepared a gourd. Yeah or a, a tree or whatever this thing is, a, uh, what do you call it, a squash, squash, to protect him from the sun. And then he prepared a worm to eat the gourd that he just created. See, when people like talk, huh? That gourd looked like his food. Yeah, it was probably yummy and he didn't want to eat it because he's gonna you know, move uh, his nice. protection away from the sun. So God created a worm to destroy what he created to protect you. Why would God do that? Hmm. Why would God destroy the thing that he gave you? You know, like he gave you a husband. He gave you a child. He gave you that car. He gave you that job. But then God allowed the husband to leave. He allowed the child to die or move away. He allowed the car to be repoed or destroyed. He, he, he allowed you to get fired or your job to close down. Why? Why would God kill my comfort zone? I was doing all right. Why would God do that? Verse number eight. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. So now Jonah's gone back into depression. It's so hot when God removed that gourd that he passed out. He passed out. This shows you, he didn't pass out before, but it shows you that God was protecting you from something worse. But why did God allow something worse to happen? If you created the gourd to protect me from passing out, why did you remove the gourd and then allow me to pass out? It don't make sense. But remember, God is sovereign. And remember, God always sees a bigger picture. He's seeing down the road. You're, you're seeing the pain and the suffering and the things you're going through right now. God cares about you more than you care about yourself. And God knows what you need more than you know what you need. Did you realize that he went back into depression and now he wants to be suicidal again? Did God know that this removing this gourd would depress him? God sent the heat. If you read before that, you, if you read it right, you'll see that God sent the wind to blow the heat on him. Because maybe God wants you to move. 
What is it going to take for you to do something different? What is it going to take for you to move? What is it going to take for you to stop what you're doing? What is it going to take for you to change? What is it going to take for you to do something else? Does God have to make you pass out? Jonah still didn't recognize that God is orchestrating his life. He still didn't realize God is trying to move him to do something else. Because Jonah haven't realized that nothing just happens. God wants you to move. God wants you to stop worrying about it. God wants you to stop worrying about it and start being about it. God wants you to just move. Is verse 9 on here? And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the Lord? Are you mad? And he said, I do well to be angry. God asked him, Why are you mad? And Jonah said, I'm so mad I can just die. And God comes again and said, So you're mad. That's the last thing that he said to him. If you go back and check, the yeah. last words God said to him is, so you mad? He does all of this and then he come back and say, wait, so you mad? He comes back and says the same thing again. He didn't change. He didn't change his instructions and he didn't change his response. So God doesn't change. Mad. He doesn't have to be changed. You, there's no reason for you to be mad. God was in control all along. He knew what was going to happen before it happened and he allowed it to happen. Are we comfortable knowing that God is going to just take care of us and he's just going to do what's best for us? God said, are you mad at what I did in your life? Verse number 10. Here's why I need everybody to tell me what you think verse number 10 means. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored. You he mad said, about the, the gourd not being there. Did you create a gourd? I made that. I took care of you. Did you praise me for it? Did you praise me for the little stuff? The little things? Can you do this? Did you praise me for that? Can you breathe on your own? Did you praise me for that? Did, what did you thank me for today? What did you, what, name the things that you thank God for today. Were you able to get out of the bed without any pain? Are you on medication? Are you in the hospital? Did you have to go to the morgue to identify a body today and say, yes, that's my loved one? Did you have to deal with that? What did you really escape today that God took away from you that you haven't realized and you haven't praised him for it yet? But you're complaining about the other stuff. You're complaining about the gourd that you never had in the first place. What would you have done? God created that for you as a blessing for you. What are you mad for? After he created the gourd that you want, you feeling sorry for, that you never made, you never grew it up. You didn't do anything for it. Verse number 11. And should not this is I, the last verse. And should I not spare Nineveh, the great city, wherein are more than six, four thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? God is trying to save souls. Thank you all for coming. God is trying to save your soul. I appreciate y'all for coming here. God is trying to do something in your life. We got to stop complaining. We got to start praising. We got to move and get away from sin. And we have to praise God because he can change his mind. Just like God changed his mind for Jonah, just like God changed his mind for um, uh, the children of Israel, just like God changed his mind for the eight people on the ark, God changed his mind about you. That's why you're still here. Stop complaining. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you.